So hello and welcome to the Holocaust Memorial and Tolerance Center's program, the Vance Conference Understanding the Origins of the Final Solution. My name is Thorin Tritter. I'm the Museum and Programming Director at the Holocaust Memorial and Tolerance Center, which is located in Glen Cove, New York. Um, I am very pleased that we are able to, or we were able to organize today's program, both, both because of the speaker and the scholar who's going to be presenting, and also because this is really a very important topic. Before I get to talk more about either of those things, I want to put in an advertisement some of, for some of our other upcoming programs. Uh, first, let me emphasize that our museum building is open for self-guided visits, but we encourage you to call in advance and reserve a timed entrance so that we can maintain social distancing in the galleries. But in addition to having our muse museum open for in-person programs and visits, we also are, of course, offering our online virtual programming. And a couple of those are on the screen here. Next Monday, January 25th at 7 p.m., I'm offering the first of four members-only lectures on the history of Jews in New York City. These pre programs are free to members of New who are free to members of HMTC, but they're also available to the wider audience, although we're charging a, a $10 fee for each of the four lectures. Uh, we hope you'll support HMTC and become a member. Uh, next Tuesday, January 26th at 6.30 p.m., we are holding our virtual gala concert with Dudu Fisher, the Israeli singing sensation and the man who starred on Broadway as Jean Valjean in Les Mis. Um, it should be a lovely evening. Tickets are available and we'd be grateful for your support. And finally, finally one more program to mention, one of the most important programs of our yearly schedule. Next Wednesday, January 27th at 6 p.m., HMTC is going to join with a number of other local Holocaust centers to mark International Holocaust Remembrance Day. Our program is entitled Under Siege Again, Holocaust Distortion and the Rise of Hate Crimes Against Jews. And it's going to include a discussion with Mark Weitzman, the Simon Wiesenthal Center's Director of Government Affairs, and Michael Bravner, the Bureau Chief of the Hate Crimes Bureau in the Queens District Attorney's Office. They're going to be talking about the political dimensions of anti-Semitism in America today and the challenges involved in prosecuting anti-Semitic and hate-based crimes at the local level. You can find more about these and all our programs on our website, www.hmtcli.org. Okay, with those advertisements out of the way, I'd like to get to our program today. I'll stop sharing my screen. Our speaker today is a man who I met about, I guess, seven or eight years ago, I think, uh, when I took a group of graduate students to the House of the Vance Conference, a museum and memorial on the outskirts of Berlin. While I had heard a number of presentations about the Vance Conference, the presentation that I heard that day from Dr. Matthias Haas was clear and insightful and helped me understand some of the dry language that I'd read from the notes of the Vance Conference that was held 79 years ago yesterday, uh, it made me understand them in a new way. When I learned more about Dr. Haas's background, I was not surprised at his gifted teaching abilities. Dr. Haas studied political science at the Free University of Berlin, focusing on the historical foundations of politics and the politics of memory. And over the past decade, while working at the Topography of Terror and the House of the Vance Conference Memorial Site and Education Center, two of the most important historical sites in Berlin that explore the Nazi past, he's organized countless international exchange seminars for Canadian, Polish, German, and American students with a range of different organizations and university. And I'm not going to go on to describe his academic publications or his various academic teaching posts, but I want to highlight that Dr. Haas curated the House of the Vance Conference's traveling exhibition entitled The Vance Conference and the Persecution and Murder of the European Jews that was shown in various museums around the country and in South Africa beginning in 2018. Dr. Haas currently serves as the acting head of the education department at the House of the Vance Conference and spends his days helping people to understand the events that took place in Vance on January 20th, 1942 and the larger history of National Socialism in Germany. I should add that I have had the pleasure of working with Dr. Haas on a number of programs since my first meeting with him, and I'm really delighted that thanks to the wonders of Zoom, we're able to have him share his expertise with us today. 
So with that introduction, thank you, Dr. Haas, and I turn it over to you. Thank you, Thorin, for those kind words and welcome to everybody. Um, and I will start sharing my screen. Um, and that should work hopefully right now. Um, so I will talk now in the next good half hour or so about uh, the historic event of the, the Wannsee Conference on the 20th of January, 1942. Um, and then the, a little bit about the context, the history um, before that. Uh, I'll run you through that and we'll talk a little bit about the, the event itself, the participants, the document, the key document that we have, the minutes of the meeting, the protocol uh, of the Wannsee Conference. Um, and then there will be time for questions and answers. So what you see here um, is the, the site, the building uh, as it uh, looks today. Um, we are a memorial site and the focus of our work is really education. Um, we work with a variety of groups and may, uh, also, and I think that is something specific. We've started with the uh, opening of, of the memorial site in 1992 with professional groups, with nurses in training, with policemen, with um, all kinds of federal ministries, uh, with lawyers, so with professionals that uh, have, um, should have an interest um, in the history because it, it's, it's also connected to their own professional uh, history. Um, so what I will talk about today, the Wannsee Conference, understanding the origins of the final solution. And it's just uh, one event, uh, the Wannsee Conference in time, but I think a lot of things come together uh, at that time. And we have a change in policy of persecution, deportation and murder uh, after that. But just to, to start briefly, the Jews as the enemy, the anti-Semitic ideology didn't begin with the Nazis. We have that early on and we have uh, here a postcard. Germans uh, think about it um, is something um, what uh, what you see here uh, and we see the the myth of the loss of World War I. You see here the German troops in the trenches, the uh, myth of being undefeated uh, in battle and the stab in the back by politicians, social democrats, by capitalists, you see here the money, by the working class in the back, but very clearly what we have here, these two figures, the Jews. The Jews are the enemy, the Jews have the money here, they sit on the money and they run the media, the newspapers. So the Jews uh, are very early on and uh, the enemy, um, even though we have in the Weimar Republic, and this is a postcard from the 20s, um, we have uh, for the first time full equality of all citizens. And, and for Jews in Germany, uh, this is really also a very, very positive, a good time. But uh, on the political extreme right, on the nationalist, uh, chauvinist uh, right, and then of course within the Nazi party and the Nazi movement, the Jews are targeted as the main enemy. And I, I leave that at that, but be, be, we have to be clear, of course, that there is a, a history of hatred towards Jews before that of anti-Semitism, uh, anti-Semitic ideology and anti-Semitic actions also, pogroms, uh, attacks on Jews uh, within the uh, uh, time frame of the Weimar Republic between 1920 and 1933. And then the Nazis come to power early on in uh, on the 30th of January, 1933, and already in April, they organize a boycott of Jewish shops. Uh, Germans, defend yourself, don't buy from Jews. And this is also a huge propaganda uh, operation. And as you see here, maybe you can read that, Germans, defend yourselves against Jewish atrocity propaganda. Uh, don't buy, buy uh, only at German shops. It is in English. So the Nazis want this to be known to the outside world. In case that New York Times would publish something, they would have it already in English. Here. So we very clearly see it is used for propaganda. Um, and often the, this, this photo is used without the, the uh, bypassers here, without this man on the left and without the woman on the right, being in a casual conversation. 
so this is a street scene, um, but it's also interesting, the shop is already closed. Uh, this was uh, propagated before seven, five, four, five, six days before um, the boycott and many Jewish store owners decided uh, on April 1st, uh, 1933 to keep their stores clo uh, closed. But very clearly here, n visible to the public, the Jews are targeted, they are not the first victims, political opposition, uh, social democrats, communists, unions are imprisoned in center concentration camps. But as the main racial enemy, we do have the Jews. And this co uh, comes and goes in waves. Uh, we have a 1933 year wave of anti-Semitism. And then again, in the summer of 1935, this is a photograph of 19, uh, from the summer of 1935 from the city of Norden. I'm a race defiler. We see a Jewish man here and his uh, non-Jewish German, German couple, Jewish and non-Jewish. She is not Jewish, he is Jewish. Um, and they're in a relationship, they are engaged. And what they do and what they live is not illegal at the time of, 19, uh, of the summer of 1935. The Nuremberg race laws that prohibit uh, marriages between Jews and non-Jews uh, inside of Germany uh, were not passed yet. But the sentiment in, in, the, in society and the population is, we know what's healthy, we know what's good for the German people. And the people is something based on ethnicity, on blood, the German blood. There is no German blood, and we often have to explain that, of course, there's no Jewish blood, there's no German blood, but it's the law. It's, uh, well, it will become the law. Here, we see a spectacle. We see policemen, even though, um, this is nothing illegal here, and we see spectators, we see teenagers, we see youngsters, we see people, people marching this couple through the streets, humiliate them, imprison them, um, because the, the uh, emphasis is Jews and Germans do not belong together. And when we talk about the Wannsee Conference, we talk about bureaucracy, we talk about the administration, the government being involved, and for them it, it has to be operational anti-Semitic measures, and there are hundreds of measures, what Jews are not allowed to do. Jews are not allowed to go shopping before four o'clock in the afternoon, can't have a telephone, can't use public telephones, can't um, have a, a cat, a dog, a bird, can't sing, can't sing in, in a choir, can't go to the sports clubs, the sporting association. So step by step, but who's Jewish? And that has to be, be defined to make persecution operationable for the administration. And here we see the Nuremberg race laws. Uh, we see people of German blood with four uh, German grandparents and Jews with um, four Jewish grandparents. And then the mix in between, three Jewish grandparents make you a Jew. And then two, well, you might be a mix of, of half and half, half Jew, one quarter Jew. And this becomes also something important then uh, at the Banzer conference and, and during the deportations, who's to be deported? How do we define uh, half Jews, one quarter Jews? Are they more Jewish or more German? Because there's also German blood. It's a racist, anti-Semitic uh, ideology and based in uh, the Nuremberg race laws. So, so uh, that is, they are passed after the Nuremberg party rally in September 35, another wave of anti-Semitic action. And of course, and you're probably aware of that, November 38, uh, the uh, night of broken glass, pogrom night, uh, that is really the, the in, in a way, the end of German Jewry as it existed uh, for almost 200 years prior to that. Um, here it is clear the regime will not stop uh, with legal measures, with, with discrimination against Jews, with making them second-class citizens, but this will go on. This will continue with violence, with destruction, and with murder. And in the night uh, from the 9th to the 10th of November, 1938, uh, hundreds of synagogues, thousands of shops, community centers are destroyed. In the first, in that night and the, uh, the week maybe after that, we have around 800 people being murdered openly in the street. So we have terror in the streets. And on the, in the morning of the 10th of November, we see that here, uh, like this photo in many German cities, uh, Jewish men are arrested, 
and brought to the concentration camps of Buchenwald, Sachsenhausen, and Dachau. And it's interesting to, to look at this photo because it's often uh, seen the regime, the terror, the violence, and in night and fog. Um, and this is not night and fog. This is during the day. It's uh, bright daylight. And we have here a Jewish men march from City Hall through the city to the synagogue. And here we see them on, on that march. Um, in the synagogue, they are forced to enter and not allowed to cover their heads and um, are forced to read excerpts from Mein Kampf. And after they leave the synagogue and eventually will be arrested and brought to uh, the concentration camp of Dachau, um, the synagogue is set on fire and burned down. But on that march, we see here these men. We see patrolling, it's police. It's also, as we see here, SS. We see the license plate, it's an SS car here. We see some civilian policemen here, that's probably Gestapo. So we do have uh, the, the perpetrators here, we have the victims here, and very importantly, we have the bystanders. We have ordinary Germans. And as you see here on the side, we have a many bikes standing there. And so it seems that people biked there to go there. Something is going on. Let's, let's have a look. What we see is we look, the, see this photo through the eyes of the photographer. It's a journalist, a photojournalist who, has, who took a, a series of eight photographs, I think, um, and off this from the police department through the city to the synagogue and uh, further on. See here on the right hand side, another photographer. We don't know the motivation of this man to take a photograph. We know this is also the photojournalist here photographs this. We don't know his mentality, but people go here to see what's going on. Maybe they want to support the regime and say, yes, we, we show our presence here and show our support to the police. Uh, maybe they want to show their solidarity to these, to the victims, to these men. We don't know, but they are an important social group, of course, in, in this whole time frame. We see, if we look at these men, these are middle-aged men, probably from the mid forties to the mid sixties, the majority of them. They are well dressed. So these are ordinary citizens. These are middle-class men. One signature feature of a, a bourgeois middle-class man of the time, we see that also here, is a man does not leave his house without his hat. You, you greet people and you say, oh, hello, and you lift your hat. And on little sign of humiliation that we see on this photograph, the Jewish men are not allowed to wear their hats any longer. You're not one of us any, any longer. You are different. We separate you, we humiliate you. And from the steps that follow imprisonment, torture, violence, murder, later on, uh, deportations and, and the mass killings, it's a small thing. But the, many of these small things led to, to, to the things that were about to follow and, and the continuing violence. In November 38, it is clear violence, open violence, open terror, open murder is the way that the Nazi government uh, is willing to go. 10 months later, World War II begins. And then with the invasion and mainly of Eastern Europe, but then after the spring of 1940, we have Germany occupying huge parts of Europe. Let's think about, go one step back about the Jewish population within Europe. And at the time, this is um, probably 1933, and you see here, and if you can maybe see that, that, that that's Jews living in Germany, in France, Great Britain. And you see that it's, it's a tiny minority. In Germany, and in our education, we ask a lot of uh, students, what do you think? How many Jews lived in Germany? And of course, the number of 6 million comes up, or 5 million, or 20% of the population. We have roughly 60 million Germans at the time. So that would be 12 million. We all know the propaganda. We all know it's the Jews, it's the Jews, it's the Jews. People think and assume, well, this must be a visible group. Five to 600,000 Jews live in Germany in the 30s. In 1933, and then around two thirds of them leave the country. But it's a tiny minority. And that's not, not unusual for Western uh, Europe. You see the same numbers, 0.65. Uh, in France, uh, one little over a percent in the Netherlands, 
In Poland, we have a minority of roughly 10% of the population. Three, three and a half million uh, Jews live in Poland, Polish Jews. Uh, but even here, it's a, it's a minority. The, but the majority of Jewish life within Europe uh, happens in the East, Eastern Europe. And as they state in the protocol of the Wannsee Conference later, uh, and, and I quote, Europe will be calm through from the West to the East. So we, we see and we bring people uh, to Eastern Europe and here is where the last step of the crimes happen. Here in Eastern Poland is where the death camps are established in occupied Poland. Now, this is on this map, you see how Germany, uh, how, how Europe, excuse me, how Europe looked um, at the 20th of January, 1942. We see here in the middle, the German Reich in dark blue. We see the light blue countries, the uh, occupied territories in, uh, on the continent from Norway to Greece, from France, really to the outskirts almost of Moscow. Germany has occupied uh, Germany has occupied Europe. We have fascist Italy being an ally to Nazi Germany. And then we have these lilac, what's well, supposed to be lilac countries here, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria, Croatia, Slovakia, right-wing authoritarian regimes, um, depe dependent really on Nazi Germany. Uh, they are not in total agreement. And if they don't behave accordingly, as it is the case of Hungary, they will be invaded in March 1940. This is the, the, the situation, that's the geographics that the military political situation of Europe and uh, on the 20th of January. The men who had come to this work meeting with breakfast afterwards, they come with a mentality of we are winning this war. Whatever we do, we can do because we, we win. It's not about finding compromise. It's not about um, finding peaceful solution. It's, it's about the racial new order of Europe. It's winning or losing. We are winning and we can create our own new world. And that means at that time, a world without Jews. So on that day, on that uh, January 20th, uh, we have these 15 men coming together for a work meeting with breakfast afterwards. Reinhard Heydrich is the one who invites to this meeting. He is the head of the Reich Security main office, the Reichssicherheitshauptamt. That is a merge of governmental state police, the security police. Part of that is the criminal police, the no ordinary police, but also the Gestapo, of course, and the security service of the SS, and that is really the, the, the secret service of the Nazi party, the internal intelligence service of the Nazi party. So we have a merger of governmental and party organizations, and that's very typical for the Nazi state, for the Nazi regime. Heydrich brings another main office of the SS, a colleague from another main office, but the other people he invites are mainly colleagues. They are all on the same level. He brings his staff. He brings his, uh, the head of the Gestapo. He brings his expert for Jewish affairs, Adolf Eichmann. Probably, I mean, he's the most known, probably, of the men attending here. He's the lowest ranking man. We have two commanders of police battalions, Dr. Rudolf Lang and Dr. Ebert Schoengart, and I will come to them, come back to them in a minute. And the other people he invites are colleagues. I cordially invite you to attend this meeting. Heydrich cannot give orders to them. Heydrich can invite them to coordinate what he calls the final solution of the Jewish question in Europe. That's the only topic of this meeting. And that means the organized, the Europe-wide deportations and mass murder in Eastern Europe. And that becomes very clear during the meeting. And we'll hear about that in a minute. Now, who's here? So we have the party, the Nazi party is here, uh, Dr. Klopfer. Um, and the, the Nazi party is in the rank of a ministry, has sort of the importance of a ministry. We have the Reich Chancellery of uh, Hitler, so the administration of the Chancellor and Führer out of Hitler is here. We have occupied territories. We have the general government, that part of Poland that is not annexed, but stays occupied. 
Um, we have the Ministry for the Occupied Territories in the East, so the Baltic states, the Soviet Union. And then we have really governmental ministries, regular, ordinary administration. The plenipotentiary of the, for the four-year plan, that's economic planning, the Ministry of Economics, basically. We have a ministry, but, but there are mergers here. We have the Foreign Office here, under Secretary of State uh, from the Foreign Office. We have the Ministry of the Interior. We have the Ministry of Justice. So we have ordinary governmental representatives here of the ministries that let's not make this mistake to say oh yeah we have police in SS here oh these are the evil guys and then the civilians we see Dr. Stuttgart here from the Ministry of Interior in his, his SS uniform so we do have people within the civilian administration also being members of the party also being in the ranks in this case of generals of the SS having a, a, a dual, double careers. Um, so that is important. And Heinrich invites to this meeting, really, and, um, and we see that here also, um, him um, more clearly. And, and, and again, let's be aware, this is a self-image. That's how they want to be presented. But Heinrich has three goals with this meeting. And the first is, and he sends a letter with the invitation, and in that letter, Göring puts him in charge. You, I, Göring, put you, Heidrich, in charge of all organizational, material, logistical matters involved with the final solution of the Jewish question in Europe. So Heidrich says, look, I'm in charge. It's a question of authority. Let's go back. We have colleagues here, but he cannot give orders to them. So that's the first thing. I'm in charge. It's a question of authority, of power, of influence. The second is to streamline the procedure, to, to parallelisierung der Linienführung, to parallelize the procedure, I need your cooperation. I and my men and agencies here are in charge, but I need your cooperation to do the procedure from Norway to France to Greece, the German Reich, of course, to have uh, the Europe-wide deportations. We are not enough men to organize them. In France, the Germans have 3,000 policemen stationed. So they need cooperation also of the French police to help with the deportations. And so having all of these people being involved uh, is essential with the authority and leadership lying with Heidelich. And the third is, what are we talking about? Final solution of the Jewish question in Europe is a term we are very aware today. That means what we call today the Holocaust, the Shoah. But at the time, it's an, it's an issue we want to solve that once and forever. At the meeting here, and come to that a bit later, they're talking clearly about eliminating, about murdering, about getting rid of people. So that is quite essential, that Heydrich invites colleagues. He has these three goals. He invites to the, 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 the guest house of the SS, the building we saw in the southwest of Berlin, a little bit in the outskirts, um, makes an impression. This is a, it's, a, it's a villa, it's a grandiose building. It's a great atmosphere, but it's also a little more secretive and Heidrich can dominate the meeting. He, he has planned this meeting and at the end, he's very pleased with the outcome because that is one of the main results. Everybody is willing to cooperate. Nobody is saying, whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute, Heidrich, what are you, what are you talking about? murdering 11 million Jews of Europe, and that is the plan, really? That's the statistics that they have? No, no, no. And they wouldn't probably openly oppose it, but they say, look, comrade Heydrich, we are really busy. We are too busy with and understaffed and come back maybe later. They're not doing that. They are all willing to cooperate in this plan to get rid of the Jews of Europe, to deport them and eventually murder them. And it's bureaucrats and bureaucracies and administration works, everybody at their place, within their range of responsibilities, do whatever needs to be done. So the Ministry of Interior, only in charge of Germany, Foreign Office, German Jews living abroad uh, in, in other countries, but also in, in where we have, we meet the diplomats in France to uh, negotiate with Vichy France, with the, the, the independent France, people who are willing to um, cooperate. Um, we have economic planning of the Jewish slave laborers that are involved. Well, how do we deal with them? So everybody is just doing their part, is willing to do their part, 
And in the end, and that's what they claim later after the war, nobody was responsible. Heydrich, we saw he is in charge. He is the man behind that. He is the driving force, but his expert for Jewish affairs, and you probably know him, and uh, Adolf Eichmann, he is in the right security, security main office, the head of the office Roman 4B4, and he becomes lo the logistic expert and the, the mastermind in organizing uh, after the spring of 1942, the deportations from all over Europe to the death camps. Which train is going with how many people from which country to which of the camps, to which of the ghettos, how we organize that. And that's all the time where communication is much slower, where you need people, where you need, uh, everything needs to be organized and that's going through um, Eichmann. Now, <clears throat> let's have a look at the main document that we have. We have here, and you see the original on the, on the left-hand side and, uh, and uh, the translation in English, the, um, the, the, there are 30 copies of this protocol that are sent out a few weeks after the meeting. Um, this is number 16, and that's the only surviving copy which was found in 1947 in the files of the Foreign Office. And we have here an ordinary uh, meeting, M minutes of a meeting here. We see here when it happened, where it happened, and who participated. Um, and we have the different, and um, Dr. Maya is the highest ranking man at the meeting, so he's mentioned first. And the first page and a half are uh, only who, who's attending, the participants. It's 15 pages long altogether. Uh, the last five pages are dealing with uh, specific issues in Germany, how to deal with Jews, uh, half Jews, and one quarter Jews, with children, without children, and, and all that, which is, that's the, the outcome, not solved. It's never clear how to deal with Jews in mixed marriages and to have Jews with children or without. But, so, but that's one third of the protocol, but it's, it's short. It's eight, nine pages, and everything, what they agree on, is in there. On page five, for example, we read, as a further possible solution, and with the appropriate prior authorization by the Führer, emigration has now been replaced by evacuation of the Jews to the east. However, these operations should be regarded only as provisional options, though in view of the coming final solution of the Jewish questions, they are already supplying practical experience of vital importance. And if we, if we look at this and, and read that, what do they say? What do they mean? And, and that's, that's the language. We don't, there's nothing uh, concrete in there. But if we only look, for example, here at the practical experience of vital importance and have a look at, at two of these men, these police commanders that I've mentioned that Heydrich orders to come to Berlin. And here we see one of them, Dr. Rudolf Lange, we get a little more insight who is at uh, what's meant with these practical experience of vital importance. Dr. Lange is the head of the security police in Latvia and he's stationed in the city of Riga. And one day before, on the 19th of January, we have a train arriving with 1,000 Jews coming from Prague, Theresienstadt, the concentration camp, the ghetto north of Prague. Um, and he, with Czech Jews, a lot of German Jews are on their way to um, mainly then Auschwitz, uh, uh, first brought to Theresienstadt, Theresien. And that train arrives in the city of Riga and the Jews are being unloaded and they are walked to the woods and murdered by the troops under the command of Rudolf Lange. 1,000 people with these police forces unloaded on trucks from the trains, brought to the woods, up, uh, 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 first uploaded, then unloaded, walked to the woods. Many have to dig the graves first and then they are murdered one by one. Under the command of Lange, a day later, he comes to Berlin and attends this meeting. And we have to be very clear with bloody hands. He and his colleague, Mr. Schoengart, they are the practitioners of mass murder. They are the ones who already have practical experience of vital importance. They know what it means to murder thousands and thousands of innocent civilians, men, women, children, young and old. 
And they probably talk in this meeting on the side of the perpetrators about issues. They talk about, well, time. It's taking a long time. You have people on trains, bringing them somewhere, arriving, putting them on trucks, into the woods, and all that. It costs money, a bullet per person. It's, it's about efficiency. And uh, we have the bodies. One, one characteristic of genocide is uh, you get rid of the evidence, you get rid of the bodies, and at the end you claim it never happened. Now we have mass graves. And at that time we have uh, between 500,000 and 1 million people were already murdered by the Einsatzgruppen that began their bloody work with around half a year earlier with the invasion of the Soviet Union. So we have already mass murder underway. This meeting at Banzi is not about deciding anything. It's about coordination. It's about implementation, about based on these practical experience and also the experiences, for example, of uh, the euthanasia killing. People with disabilities are murdered in, with, with poison gas uh, in the nursing homes and hospitals. That is something that what, which they will expand later on with the same personnel. Now, let's continue with the protocol a, a little bit. That's, uh, we had page number five, now it's page seven. In the course of the final solution and under appropriate direction, the Jews are to be utilized for work in the East in a suitable manner. In large labor columns and separated by sex, Jews capable of working will be dispatched to these regions to build roads and in the process, a large number of them will undoubtedly drop out by way of natural reduction. And it continues on page eight. Those who ultimately should possibly get by will have to be given suitable treatment because they unquestionably represent the most resistant segments and therefore constitute a natural elite that, if allowed to let go free, would turn into a germ cell of renewed Jewish revival. Brackets witness the experience of history. That is the language. There is not a single word of shooting, of gassing, of murdering people. We have here very clearly the slave labor uh, capable of working will be dispatched to these regions to build roads and in the process a large number will undoubtedly drop out by way of natural reduction. We work them to death. The program of extermination through labor in the camps, that's what they refer to. And the ones who survive that will have to be given suitable treatment. That, that's enough. They know what that, that means. And there is only one way to read and understand this. They will be murdered. Prisoners who in the camps who get a note on their files and special treatment required. They, will, they are dead a day later. You don't need to write, please shoot them, murder them, kill them. You need suitable treatment only. And people know what's meant. Bureaucracies use always a language that, that this is distanced, but this is also secretive language, but everybody knows what is meant with this. And they, uh, we have that from the, the, the uh, interrogation of Adolf Eichmann, 1960-61 um, in Jerusalem, after, where he is tried and where he says, look, this is the protocol, but he was surprised how openly during this meeting these men talk to each other. Even the the most um, sort of, with the mentality as, as civil servants, the most bureaucratic uh, characters of that. Here, they were very open about murdering people. And for the ones if still think we were not sure what, what's meant, page six of the protocol has the statistics. We have the statistics here of how many, at the time, the Jews live in Germany or in, in, in uh, and live in, excuse me, live in Europe at the time. We have the Altreich here, that's Germany, the Ostmark, Austria, and then we have the Eastern uh, territories uh, uh, of Germany, the general government, and all the statistics that Eichmann collected before the meeting. And we have Estonia, for example, here, that's already free of Jews. The Einsatzgruppen have murdered the Estonian Jews at the time already completely. We have France, differentiated, occupied and unoccupied territories, and category A, that are the countries under our control. And category B, those are the countries that we still need to get under control, or where we send our diplomats. In the case of Bulgaria, Bulgaria, oh, we have the foreign office here. Please, the diplomats go to the Bulgarian government. 
and the diplomat said, please, Bulgaria, hand over your Jews. And the Bulgarian government, even though they are right-wing authoritarian and anti-Semitic, they don't get that far. So they, there's negotiations and they say, look, you can have the non-Bulgarian Jews living in Bulgaria. And they are handed over to the Germans, deported to Auschwitz and murdered. But the Bulgarian Jews are Bulgarian citizens. And the, the duties of a government are the protection of their citizens. And then again, the, the suggestion of the German uh, diplomats is, well, maybe you want to pass a law as according to our laws that by leaving the country, people, Jews, lose citizenship. So you just have to bring your Jews to the border as Bulgarian citizens. And by walk, getting them over the border, they lose citizenship and, and you're not in charge any longer and we'll take care of them which means we will murder them. Um, and they don't do that. The Bulgarian government uh, decides not to hand over the Jews. And so the Bulgarian Jews are more or less saved. They pay extra taxes. There is anti-Semitic legislation, but they are not deported and murdered. So it doesn't work. Against England, and it seems a matter of time until the war against England is won, and eventually, and we all know that, they don't uh, win the war, but uh, they have this already in their statistics. And the plan is all together to murder 11 million Jews of Europe. And this statistic gives us an idea of the bureaucratic nature without the bureaucrats planning, sitting together at Wannsee, and then throughout Germany, throughout Europe, and organizing the procedure um, of deportations and murder. The, the crimes could not have happened in that way. In the spring of 1942, or, or at the time of the Wannsee conference, we have over three quarters, three quarter, 75% of the victims are still alive. A year and a half later, at the end of November 1943, 75% are dead. So within that short time frame, after the Wannsee Conference, the deportations begin to the death camps, to um, the, the killing centers, Treblinka, Sobibor, Belgets, which are small camps, just killing facilities, or gas chambers, crematoria, or open burning pits. And, and that's it. In Auschwitz, we have both a concentration camp for slave labor and a killing site. In Majdanek, the same. And we have in Chalno, Kulmhof, the gas vans in operation. So with these six camps, we have the machinery to murder 75% uh, of those, the six million Jews that are murdered eventually uh, during uh, the Holocaust. And with people dying on the trains and the ghettos through slave labor and so on and so forth. But this is really the key, the, the, the core of the program of murder, which happened um, after the spring of 1942 and which needed the, um, the bureaucracy ad administration. Germany loses the war, and I will come to an end in a second. And just to give you an idea, and all these people who said, well, we never did anything. All these 15 men said, well, I was just sitting at my desk. The, what happened to them is if we have the short answer of these 15 men, nobody was ever tried for participating at the Wannsee Conference. It played a role in some of the trials, Eichmann, for example. It came up in other trials against Wilhelm Stuttgart, but nobody was really sentenced for being part of the meeting uh, at Wannsee. Some people are even released and have regular careers um, in West Germany, uh, in until the late 80s. And here you see the obituary for uh, the participant from the Nazi party, Dr. Gerhard Klopfer, who was a lawyer who went back to his hometown, to the city of Ulm, and had a career as an established citizen in his hometown until 1987. And then we mourn the death of Dr. Klopfer after a fulfilled life to the well being of everybody under his influence. Until the late 80s really, the mentality of these people and the atmosphere in Germany was, well, they just did their job. Nobody talked about the perpetrators. At the time, things are changing. And today, um, I think the atmosphere in Germany has changed. And this obituary causes a scandal. It is published nationwide. It's a regional paper only, because at the time we know who Klopka was. We know we knew what the Wannsee Conference was. And so we see also, even in an in a innocent obituary, we see how difficult it was for German society to come to terms with the past. 
And I will end here, um, and we have, I think, a little more time for your questions. Thank you so much, Matthias. That's very helpful. And I know that some questions are already coming in. Just encourage others to, to share them. Uh, I've answered a couple that I just while you were speaking, but let me let me mention or let me raise a couple of the questions that have come in with you. One is just about who was at the conference. I, I know you talked about it, but why wasn't Hitler at the conference? Why weren't more senior people from those ministries at the conference? You said that they were equal. They were not the highest level. So why weren't the highest level people there? Yeah, and that's one of the key questions that we often get. This is not about decision making. This is not about um, about deciding what to do with the Jews. This is about implementation. These people are in the ranks of Staatssekretäre, permanent secretaries of the administration. This is about how do we want to do this? And these are the experts of the administration. These are the ones who know how to run the show, how to run an administration, who has to cooperate with whom. So we have Eichmann. Oh, we have a colleague in the foreign office and Dr. Rademacher and Franz Rademacher and Eichmann have already cooperated. So this is about implementation. Hitler has probably, in, in, co in co communication with Himmler, made that decision in the month of December 1941. We do not have the written order where Hitler says that, but we have uh, indications that, that at the time probably the final decision was made by Hitler to murder off the, uh, all European Jews. That's all he wanted to, to be part of. He doesn't care about the different steps that were involved. And the, even the, this is not political decision making. That are the ministers. We are a level below that to implement that. And that's why we do not have these people, uh, or only these people here, and not more famous people, Göring, Goebbels, and so on. Um, somebody asks, asks a question that I think gets to a common misconception and that the person writes, I had understood that part of the purpose of the conference was to convince some German Nazis to actually agree to extermination. Is, how would you respond to that? Is that a correct understanding of what the conference was? No, I don't, I don't, I think they were already aware and they were willing to cooperate and they were part of that already on all levels. And we have the killers already being there. But we have Mr. Stucker, the Ministry of Interior, regular government administration. He is involved in anti-Jewish legislation in the mid-30s. He writes the commentary to the Nuremberg race laws with a colleague. What does that mean? The, so the legal interpretations of that. The, we, we are aware of that. The Jews have to go. And with the war, the, the military war, we have the beginning of the race war, and people are willing to cooperate with that. On that level, nobody needs to be convinced. Nobody needs to say, I mean, how? And then they say, look, I'm not doing things. I'm just sitting at my desk. I'm just filling out forms or writing notes or coordinating things. I, I BSS, they are the murderers. But no, they are all part of that and they are willing to be part of that. They are convinced. And there is a lot, I mean, often it's not even mentioned the anti Semitism, the anti Jewish attitude of these participants. It is such so deeply ingrained into them. We don't need to talk about why the Jews and really the Jews. No, no, we know that. They are in agreement with that. So as to say to be convinced of or disagreements on, on that level, I don't, I don't think so. And somebody else poses a question now that's about the educational level of the people at the conference. And I know you mentioned at the beginning of your talk that you do a lot of work with professionals. And uh, could you tell us a little more about how that links to the, the people who are at the conference? In, in, in the 50s, there was always the image of the, the Nazis as being uneducated, people who were unemployed in the world economic crisis, lo looking for a job, having a career with the Nazi government. And with these men, um, that's not the case. Um, and I mentioned some of them, Dr. Klopfer and Dr. Stuckart and Dr. Lange and Dr. Schöngart, even the murderers, well-educated men. Um, I think nine of them went to university, eight of them had a PhD, a doctorate. Um, eight of them were lawyers. So these are well-educated men convinced of what they were doing. If we look at what else they have, and they uh, don't have a lot in common. I mean, these are from different backgrounds, mainly middle class, but that's very broad. Um, different regions from Prussia, but also from Württemberg and Saxony. The average age is 42 years old, um, but that is young. That is something, most of them, and we, if we take away two or three of, of the old administrators, Mr. Kritzinger, born in 1890, I think, we have a generation, a good half, over half of them are born between 19 and 1910. 
So that's like a generation that really fills a lot of the ranks of the Nazi, Nazi regime, of the SS, of the administration. People too young to fight in World War I, educated in the loss of World War I, and willing to make Germany strong and great again and bring it back to power, the place it deserves in the world, no matter the cost. And mass killing and murder is part of that. And they do that with their education. They can convince of what they do. They're well educated. Uh, people who often work in the administration often, often are then for their ne next promotion to go into active duty at the front lines. And the front lines for these people does not mean fighting a military enemy, but killing Jews, killing innocent civilians. So uh, well educated, young, convinced. That is really something they have in common. Um, I wondered, you said that this was the one, that we have one extant copy of the protocols of the minutes from the meeting. And um, so could you just talk a little about how long it took to understand that this was a significant meeting that took place? Was that something that, you know, the U.S. Army, as soon as they found this, they said, wow, this is obviously the key moment in the Holocaust. Or what, what was the process? No, it's, it's, it's not. I mean... <laughs> The, the the order to destroy documents was given, I think, in November '44 by Himmler already. So it was clear to them the Allies are coming and they're looking for evidence. And it, they made very clearly uh, that unconditional surrender is their goal of Nazi Germany. And so there were many of the documents were destroyed. Get rid of the evidence. Get rid of the the bodies. And then that's what they did. They dug up the mass graves and burned the corpses but they get rid of the evidence. So 29 of these copies were destroyed. And the one copy that was found was found in the files of Martin Luther from the Foreign Office, who was at the time imprisoned because he started an intrigue against his minister and failed and was in prison. His files were bound together, uh, the files in the Foreign Office of uh, the, the Jewish Affairs. And in the March 1947, they were found in sort of, um, preparations for follow-up trials to the major war criminal trial in Nuremberg. And people look through files and finally they find this copy, read it, and they understand this is a key document. But, and then they, they phoned uh, uh, Robert Kempner, who was the state prosecutor, a German lawyer who had emigrated to the US and came back with the US troops and now helped the, the um, team of prosecutors in Nuremberg the American prosecutors, and he immediately understood this is sort of a key document that we have. And then he confronted some of these defendants and they said, well, I've never seen that. And final solution, I have no idea what this means. So at the time, there was no understanding of that. And it was, it was published for the first time in Germany, I think in the early 50s. At the time in Germany, nobody was interested in, in looking, at, looking for the perpetrators. No, it was the Nazis. And the interesting thing is it was always the ones who were dead. Göring, oh, Hitler, Himmler, Göring, not, not as long as he was alive. When he was dead, he was guilty. But everybody else, no, they, they're not here any longer. So looking at that took some time. And it was very hard to prove to the, to the people, well, what was meant with that. So you need also other evidence and documents. But over time, it was understood that this was one of the key meetings. I mean, there is not that one meeting. You have process leading up to that, and we have a change of policy. But, but uh, I think it eventually took really until uh, 40 years almost later before people understood uh, the cent centrality of administration, of bureaucracy, and people sitting in Germany, in Berlin, and all the villages and towns, and doing the paperwork, uh, that that was an essential part of organizing the crimes that happened then in East, occupied Eastern Europe, but, but were organized um, in, inside of Germany from the desk. Um, you raised the, the issue about people who were held accountable and went to trial. How many of the, is it 14 people who were at the conference? How many of them faced some kind of trial at the end of the war? So, I mean, the simple answer I, I, I gave to you, we have 15 people there and we have, um, Roughly one third does not survive the war. Heidrich himself does not survive the war. Five months later, there's an attack on his life by Czech partisans because he's also ruling over Bohemia and Moravia from Prague, and he dies five days later, I think. So he's dead. Uh, some people from the Ministry of Justice die in the bombing of Berlin um, at the end of the war. So we have people, uh, one third of them roughly is dead. One third is tried for other crimes. 
Dr. Schöngart, the one uh, we had Mr. Lange, who was sitting in Riga and participating in the mass killings, he is killed in the fighting uh, over the city of Posen, Poznan today. Mr. Schöngart is arrested by the British military. And they know he was a key figure in the mass crimes. He was one of these leaders of these killing squads. But uh, the legal system was not meant for them. You usually need in a criminal trial, you need um, a, a, a perpetrator, you need a victim, you need a place, and you need a date for the crime. These people killed a numerous people in many places. So Schoengart was tried and sentenced to death and executed for killing one prisoner of war. That's a war crime. And we have here the victim, the perpetrator, and the crime. And that's what the Allies used. Others were sentenced as bureaucrats. Mr. Stuttgart from the Ministry of Interior, well, I was, I didn't know what that meant. And because he was in a position to deporting the half Jews and one quarter Jews, he presented himself as being oh, not really a resistance, but opposition. I mean, and they got, got away with that in that respect that he was sentenced for to uh, exactly the time that he already had served. So he, had, he was in prison for three years and a couple of months and the sentence was for that. So he was released um, like many of them. I mean, the most known example of somebody who was tried was Eichmann, um, who was uh, escaped like many Nazis of South America, was kidnapped by the Israeli Secret Service in 1960, brought to Jerusalem, and then we have the famous trial against Eichmann. Um, and he is executed, oh, sentenced to death and executed in, at the end of May, 1962. So we have around one third that was tried and, and sentenced to all, uh, some to, to uh, um, killed, executed, but many only for some period of time. And one third was not tried at all. They go back to their own uh, life. Mr. Klopfer, Mr. Hofmann, um, they all really are released and never face uh, any consequences. Um, we only have a few more minutes before we need to finish. I wondered if you could talk to us a little about uh, when the educational site was created and what kind of visitors you have, what kind of numbers of people come, uh, and, and the response that you see from the, the public that visits you. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it took a long time in Germany to establish really historic sites, authentic sites, as memorial sites. I mean, for a long time, the Nazis were the old, the perpetrators, the bystanders were integrated, we moved forward, we rebuilt the country. And really only with the change of generations and over time, we have a change in attitude. And from the late, late 70s on, early 80s on, we have more and more grassroots initiatives, citizens initiatives that get involved and say, we want to find out more, not only about the history, but where it happened. Oh, it happened here. And we have throughout at the time, West Germany and East Germany, I leave that out, a different complicated story, but in West Germany, a lot of citizens, grassroots organizations that carry that memory and uh, do research and do things um, in that. And also in Berlin, we have around the Gestapo uh, terror, uh, area where it's today topography of terror and the house of the Wanze Conference. And at that time in the mid eighties, the decision was made um, to establish a memorial site which was then opened in, at the 50th anniversary of the Wannsee Conference. But it's important to mention also, there was an attempt before in the mid 60s by a survivor, Josef Wolf, a Polish survivor from Krakow who was a historian, had published books in Germany uh, after the war about, about the persecution uh, of the Jews. And he wanted to establish in the mid 60s a documentation center about the Nazi past and its consequences. And he failed at that time German society is not ready to face their own responsibilities about the consequences, even reintegration of perpetrators. So it took 50 years to establish that. Early on, and, and it was used for educational purposes, for professional groups, and that is really, I think, still going on and growing. People had thought after 1995, the 50th anniversary of the end of World War II, okay, now it's enough, numbers of memorials sites of visitors will go down. The opposite is true. We have now, I think, over 100 memorial sites in Germany, small and large former camps, small synagogue sites, places of perpetrators as the House of the Wannsee Conference, um, and the numbers altogether uh, go up. People still want to learn, want to find out, especially about the site, uh, the, the responsibility of ordinary citizens of ordinary administration um, in that. And that is what we focus on, really, um, the, the people who study law in, in 
Berlin and the state of Brandenburg um, who, who go through a two, after their studies and exams to a two-year trainee program. They all come for study day to Wannsee. So lawyers, for example, we work with uh, four or five different federal ministries in there, and it's always about the past, but also, also about our current responsibilities as professionals, but also as citizens. We, uh, one of the focus is we deal with the bystanders, as you've seen in the photo from uh, November 1938. The, the bystanders and their responsibility, even if they didn't participate, they didn't enough from uh, preventing this from happening. So that's still, um, I think there's a lot of interest we have around one. Half of our visitors are coming from abroad. The largest group that comes to uh, us from abroad is from Israel. We have a lot of, I mean, I think there are hardly any, any Jewish groups that come to, uh, Wannsee, uh, to, to Berlin that do not come to Wannsee. So just briefly that as a glimpse. And whenever you have the chance to come in the next year or so, you're very welcome. We hope we will be able to travel in the next year or so. I put the website, uh, the, the address for the House of the Vance Conference website. There's a lot of information on there. And I can attest to the power of the location of, of the educational site. Uh, really an impressive place to visit. And I thank you, Matthias, for talking with us and sharing your expertise. And I look forward to finding ways to, to work with the House of the Vance Conference going forward. So thanks so much. Have a wonderful evening. And to everybody out there, thanks for tune, tuning in. Thank you for inviting me and thank you. Thank you. Okay. Have a great night. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye -bye.